Getting back to the cell cycle here, this is just showing the cell cycle we know. We've discussed there's an R point late in G1, and we've, I've shown you that there's a bunch of different cyclins that are expressed at different times in the cell cycle. Now, cyclin D and cyclin um, dependent kinase 4 or 6 is, is one of those complexes that's important as you approach G1 here. Okay, so, um, so you can then um, phosphorylate various proteins and control um, getting past this restriction point. And soon we're going to be looking at the retinoblastoma protein because it's one of the proteins that's phosphorylated by these cyclin dependent kinases. Okay, so now we can start to understand how the retinoblastoma functions as a tumor suppressor because we're starting to put it its activity in relation to the cell cycle. So, retinoblastoma, it undergoes phosphorylation and it's phosphorylated um, in a cell cycle dependent way. So, early in the G0 phase of the cell cycle, retinoblastoma is unphosphorylated, so it's not phosphorylated. During G1, retinoblastoma becomes weakly phosphorylated, okay, early in G1. As you move towards the restriction point in late G1, retinoblastoma, sorry, as you approach um, the restriction point of G1, retinoblastoma becomes more um, phosphorylated, more highly phosphorylated, and it becomes hyperphosphorylated as you pass the restriction point, and it remains hyperphosphorylated um, until you get to the end of the cell cycle where it again returns to an unphosphorylated state. And here's a diagram that just shows that now. So here's our cell cycle, here's our restriction point, and on the outside here now, we're just looking at the phosphorylation status of retinoblastoma. So in early G1, as I said, retinoblastoma is not phosphorylated. It becomes hypo, lightly phosphorylated, as you progress through G1, and then at some point, through the action of these cyclin-dependent kinases, it becomes hyperphosphorylated. So retinoblastoma becomes hyperphosphorylated, and this allows cells then to pass restriction point. And retinoblastoma stays phosphorylated up until the um, cell cycle, um, you know, you, you get the offspring, you, you get um, cell cycle division, and then retinoblastoma returns to a hypo or dephosphorylated state. So um, we've also, just, just while we're talking about how important the phosphorylation status of retinoblastoma is, um, we've been, earlier we were talking about oncoproteins, okay? And we talked about tumor viruses and some of the endogenous proteins in a tumor virus actually act on retinoblastoma, okay? And these oncoproteins, which are viral proteins, they bind to retinoblastoma, and when they're bound to retinoblastoma, they effectively inhibit the function of retinoblastoma. So they, these oncoproteins, they effectively turn off the break. They turn off retinoblastoma. So oncoproteins can basically um, make retinoblastoma behave as if it's phosphorylated. And phosphorylated retinoblastoma is inactive. So it doesn't act as a break here. It only acts as a break here. Okay? And once you phosphorylate retin retinoblastoma, it turns off the break. And some tumor viruses can bind to retinoblastoma and effectively turn it off, regardless of its phosphorylation state. Okay? So one of, another one of these proteins, the E7 oncoprotein from human papillomavirus, which is important in cerv cervical cancer, um, can bind to retinoblastoma and effectively turn off and in inactivate the protein. So the question is now, if we really want to understand this process, is how does retinoblastoma inhibit cell growth? So we know the um, cell cycle machinery with the cyclins and the cyclin-dependent kinases phosphorylate retinoblastoma. 
So it turns off retinoblastoma, but what is it turning off? What, what, what's it stopping? Okay. So um, effectively, um, we're going to look at, um, I've discussed this already, effectively now we're going to look at how um, retinoblastoma phosphorylation inactivates it. So retinoblastoma is, um, is something that controls this restriction point, and when it becomes hyperphosphorylated, it loses its growth inhibitory powers, and cells enter G1 and go through a round of division. So this little green blob here represents retinoblastoma, and these red blobs here rec um, represent either a cyclin and its kinase. So here's a cyclin-dependent kinase, which phosphorylates retinoblastoma. And this occurs as you progress through G1. You get more of this, you get more of this, and therefore you get more phosphorylation. So as it becomes phosphorylated, effectively it becomes hyperphosphorylated, at which point this protein is no longer active. So what is this protein doing? What is retinoblastoma doing? And why, um, you know, so, so we know that retinoblastoma phosphorylation status is controlled by cyclin-dependent kinases, and it becomes hyperphosphorylated and inactivated. So what is it doing? Um, it's just putting the two diagrams together. Um, effectively, retinoblastoma, its function is to bind to some transcription factors. And when these transcription factors are bound by the tumor suppressor, by the suppressor protein, this retinoblastoma, these transcription factors become inactive. Okay? So when retinoblastoma is unphosphorylated, so early G1, it binds and inactivates these transcription factors. When you phosphorylate retinoblastoma, you release the transcription factors and it's the transcription factors that drive um, progression across the restriction point. I think I've got a diagram somewhere. Okay, so here's that green blob we were looking at, and we know that this green blob is retinoblastoma, and it becomes, um, in early G1, lightly phosphorylated or not phosphorylated. And in this state, it binds to this transcription factor. There's a range of them, E2F ones, twos, threes, we'll just call them E2F. It binds to a family of transcription factors called E2F and it sequesters, it, it inactivates E2F. Once um, the cyclin-dependent kinases phosphorylate retinoblastoma, it dissociates from E2F. So it releases these E2F factors, which in these transcription factors can then turn on genes. And it turns on a bunch of genes that are really important for DNA replication. And then once you um, activate DNA replication, you then go into S phase and, um, and, and you go through a round of replication. What effectively happens later, once you've passed, turned on these genes for DNA replication, is that the E to F proteins are broken down by the cell and then the, the retinoblastoma protein remains phosphorylated until, um, in a new cell, it then becomes um, dephosphorylated again. And then once the E2Fs are uh, transcribed in the new cell, they become inactive, and it's a repeating cycle. So retinoblastoma effectively binds to transcription factors to inactivate them. And then when you phosphorylate retinoblastoma through these signaling molecules, signaling machinery, which makes the cyclin activates the kinase, this gets phosphorylated, and then um, E2F becomes active. So this is a relatively simple model now of how retinoblastoma controls a cell cycle. So in early and middle parts of G1, these transcription factors, these E2Fs, associate um, with promoters and things, but because they're bound by retinoblastoma, they're inactive. And then, um, so effectively, <clears throat> um, during uh, much of G1 phase, these genes that require E2F 
um, are not expressed. So you have repression of gene expression. Now, again, this is just some diagrams that show what I've been talking about. So here we have the transcription factor with its binding partner, or its dimer dimerization partner, bound at a promoter. Now that would be active, except for the fact that um, you've got a retinoblastoma protein, which is hypo, so it's not very, it's not phosphorylated to any great extent, binds to the transcription factors, and that turns off gene expression. So transcription is repressed. So retinoblastoma is acting as a suppressor of gene of, 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 of cell growth. Okay, now at some point um, the retinoblastoma protein can also um, bring in these things that we've already talked about. So it can bind to histone deacetylases. Okay, so effectively the retinoblastoma brings in these histone deacetylases and if you recall from just a while back in this in this lecture, I, I was show, showing you that the deacetylases act to remove acetyl groups from lysine residues on histones. It makes the histones positively charged, the histones bind to DNA to make the nucleosome really compacted and it turns off transcription. So now we have um, this understanding of how a tumor suppressor protein such as retinoblastoma can not only sequester and and sort of stop these transcription factors from being active, but can also bring in a histone deacetylase to make the nucleosome really tightly compacted. So when you phosphorylate retinoblastoma, you release E2F. So pocket proteins is another term for retinoblastoma. Once you phosphorylate these pocket proteins, you release these E2F transcription factors and then you turn on a bunch of genes. Now, um, the products of these genes are genes that are required for DNA synthesis. So you, uh, you push the cells into S phase, which is the synthesis phase. And I've also mentioned to you that there are some viral oncoproteins which bind to retinoblastoma and they effectively um, mimic a hyperphosphorylated protein. They effectively, the viral proteins, viral oncoproteins, they prevent retinoblastoma from binding to E to F, and therefore they allow these transcription factors to be active all the time, which is how they drive cancer. Okay, but effectively, what we're saying is that um, retinoblastoma becomes hyperphosphorylated. It releases these transcription factors, which turn on genes required for S phase. So, um, so effectively, once you remove the green blob that was retinoblastoma, you, if you allow these other activities. Now, this isn't histone deacetylase, this is histone acetylase. So, in the absence of retinoblastoma, the E2Fs can also bind a histone acetylase. So, that's going to acetylate the histone proteins. It's going to remove that positive charge from the lysine residues of the histones and therefore the histones are not going to bind strongly to negative DNA and that loosens up the, the nucleosome and allows transcription to proceed. And I've already hinted at this but what sort of genes are turned on when you um, inactivate retinoblastoma or you allow E to F to become active Genes involved in DNA synthesis are turned on. So, um, you know, a lot of um, precursor nucleotides uh, um, are made by, you know, some of the proteins that are turned on. And other genes involved in DNA replication are turned on. So there's a whole list of um, 20 or 30 proteins which are expressed by E to Fs. And the majority of these proteins are involved in replicating DNA. And lastly, as you transit this re restriction point, other cyclins become active, other cyclins activate other cyclin-dependent kinases, and then 
this leads to the phosphorylation of the transcription factor now. So the E2F and its, its partner become um, phosphorylated and then this, re this results in dissociation of these transcription factors and then they're, they're broken down by the cell.